free time, you know, we might as well meet uh, together, fellowship in the house of the Lord, worship God together. Uh, and God's good all the time. God can bless us at any any place, at any time. Uh, but uh, there's just something about that Saturday night, especially when you think back to all the Saturday nights, drinking and carousing, and uh, stepping out and, into the darkness of sin in, in the world. It's a, it just makes it that much more of a celebration. Because you know you're not you're not in that place you're not in those places of sin anymore. God has made a change. God has brought us out, and uh, we had some uh, some good services this week. I was able to attend service with Pastor and Sister Hall, who's our district overseer. Uh, he, they live in uh, Glendale, Arizona. He came all the way over to California. Amen. Right, he crossed over um, the the borderline. Amen, Arizona to California. And it's kind of like going into a different country. Because California is the only state where they stop you at the border. And, uh, you know, not, I'm not talking about from Mexico to California. I'm talking about anywhere you're coming in to California. They've got a checkpoint. And uh, and they make you stop like a toll booth or something. They say, they say, do you have any fruit or vegetables, fruit or plants? And boy, if you say you do, they're going to, okay, thank you. Why don't you pull over here? Well, one of our overseers one time, they, they made him stop his motor home at the northern border uh, of California. And uh, they, they went on board his motor home because he had, you know, he had some fruit. He had some grapefruit they had bought from the store as part of the choosing motor homes, like a home on wheels. And uh, so they had this box of grapefruit or something. And uh, they're like, okay, we'll pull, pull up over here. And they, they got on board the motor home and they're looking through all the cupboards and cabinets and stuff. I'm, I'm serious. That, that happened. That, that really, really, really happened. So but when an overseer comes to California, I mean, that's that's really a blessing. I mean, they're, they're taking one for the team. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Thank you, Reverend Hall and Sister Hall. And uh, we had service uh, a Tuesday night in Oceanside. It's about 300 miles from Fresno. And, uh, and then Wednesday night we had service in Bakersfield. That's about 100 miles from Fresno. And then Thursday night, we had service in Norwalk, which is on the outskirts of Los Angeles. And uh, and that's about, I'm not sure exactly how far, about 200 probably, close to 200 miles. But uh, it was worth it all. It was worth all the traveling, worth all the driving, worth all the, the gas money, uh, worth the offerings. Wh whatever went into it, it was worth it all. It was a blessing to be with the brethren, the saints of God. And so uh, if you didn't attend any of those services this, this last time, um, there's good news. We, we're going to have a church conference, Bible conference, April 12th through the 15th at our national uh, campground. In, in, uh, it's close to Mexico, Missouri. And, uh, and so that's going to be a blessing. The you know, service starts Monday night and then it goes uh, Tuesday, uh, Monday night through Thursday night. Um, and it's just nice to step away. And so, so people are so busy, they're, they're, they're going to they're gonna die while they're busy doing other things. But death is going to catch up to you no matter how busy we are. Amen. There's, there's no rescheduling it. There's no uh, postponing it. It's like, well, I can't die right now. I'm busy. Well, you know, if, if we, we, can't, we can't be too busy to die, then we shouldn't be too busy to live. And if we're not too busy to live... Uh, then we shouldn't be too busy to be a Christian to live that abundant life Jesus talked about in John chapter 10. And, you know, in, in the Old Testament, God commanded Israel to gather together to worship in Jerusalem three times in the year. He said, all the men shall appear before me. And the men didn't come by themselves, right? The ladies were there. The kids were there. Uh, you can see in uh, Luke chapter 2, I believe it is, uh, where Mary and Joseph and Jesus went to Jerusalem for the feast, and Jesus was 12 years old, and he abode still in Jerusalem. That was one of those feasts, right? And so here we are in the New Testament. So we're free from the law, preach. We don't have to do any of that. Uh, that that uh, that religious ceremony. We're free from all of that ceremonialism, etc. Well, I got news for you: the, the precedents that God said in the Old Testament. Uh, the majority of it is still carried through into the New Testament. And although we don't have to observe all these uh, legal matters, uh, there still is the precedent of getting apart, right? We don't practice the Sabbath anymore, 
but there still is the precedent of making time for God. Everything God made was good, but on the seventh day, the Bible says God rested and he sanctified it. So God, God made things good, but he made time holy. And so there's no substitute for the time that we can spend made holy, sanctified unto God. And that's what conference is for us. It's that sanctified time. You step out of your normal life. You step out of the worldly affairs, so to speak. And you get together with the saints of God. You're out there in the middle of nowhere, farm country in Missouri. But I want you to know God visits his people at that campground in Missouri. Yes, sir. And you can't get a blessing over here in California the same as you can over there in Missouri. It's yes, just sir. not the same. And the people that think it's the same, they're the same people that have never gone to conference. You say, well, I can't, I can't afford it. I can't. You know, for me, you know, it, it's like paying tithe and giving hours. I, it's people say, I can't afford it. I can't afford not to. I can't afford not to. Because, I mean, you think of everything God has done for us and that he requires so little in return and for us to balk and push back at anything that God would expect of us, uh, it just doesn't really make sense to me. But maybe it's just me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe I've got the wrong mind about things. I don't know. <laughs> but if you want to go, you, you get with me. There's some, uh, some rules uh, pertaining to the campground that you need to uh, go over. Don't just buy a plane ticket and, and just show up, right? Because it's a closed conference, not open to, to everyone in the world and everybody and their brother and their uncle. But if you want to go, let's, uh, let's get together. We'll talk about it. And you won't regret it. You know, I'm going. I'm going. Yes, sir. If I got to drive, I'll drive. If, I gotta, if I'm going to fly, I'll fly. If I got to fly and drive. If I'm flying while I'm driving, hey, there you go. <laughs> get there faster. I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I'm breaking the ground land speed record. I'm just kidding. So it's just, you're just driving to the next whatever. You know, it's not the cannonball run. So, uh, uh, but that's coming up in April. And uh, if if you really pray, if you really pray, you get the voice of God, get the mind of God, get the mind of Christ. I believe God will lead you to make the right decision. Amen. Amen. How many still love the Lord? Yes, sir. Amen. Yes, sir. Amen. All right. Well, it's good to be here in church this morning. I'd like to ask Reverend to come and say what we're waiting for. For the Lopez. Amen. You know, I, I come in and I, I don't like to just come up here and just, you know, kind of just go off, but I like to share something that's on my heart, you know, and there's a blessing just going, we're reading in the book, we're, we're doing a, a Bible study, my wife and I together, and, and we're reading in the book of Leviticus. And Leviticus, you got to pay attention to Leviticus. <laughs> there's, a lot of, there's a lot that God puts out in there, in the law and everything. But something that really speaks out, that he begins to tell them, he says, he keeps saying, God keeps saying over and over again, I am the Lord God and I am holy and I am the one that sanctifies thee. And that's something about you. You know, it's not something in our own works, in our own minds, and anything that we can do. But it's in that relationship with God. You see, God is the one that's holy. God is the one that's sanctified. But when we begin to come into His presence and we begin to spend time with Him, He begins to part or begins to put that onto us. And that's such a challenge. But then I begin to read in the New Testament under John where he said that he came unto his own and his own didn't receive him. But he said to those that believed on him, to them he gave power to become the sons of God. And where it goes on to say that which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. What he's saying is this is a special relationship. This is a special covenant between you and I. And I just want you to know that it is such a blessing because God is faithful to Amen. find a person with a character like that and just to have him a part of your life and all that he does. It is such a blessing to know what God does in people's lives. Amen. Appreciate the Lord and his goodness. Amen. And we're thankful for each one that uh, was able to make their way despite whatever the flesh was trying to get you to just 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 take a sick day just forget about it 
you know, you, you already went to church, uh, you know, one of these other services in the week, or you watched online, whatever, but just count that. And uh, that, to me, that's, I'm going to try, try to be good here, but, but uh, the, the problem with TV ministry and online ministry is you, you can pacify, you can cause people to feel pacified to where they don't need to go to church. You say, well, I watched it on TV, I watched it online. Um, that's not fulfilling the obligation that God has required of us to assemble together. He said in Hebrews chapter 10, not forsaking the assembling of yourselves together. If you're at home, you're not together with anyone else if they're outside the home. So, um, yeah, so I mean, it's a blessing, and I'm not trying to uh, speak against what we ourselves are doing. So you're, you're, uh, you're conflicted because you're doing an online stream broadcast and you're telling people that that's not, that's not good enough. Uh, all I'm saying is that's not the same as assembling together. And if all you can do is watch online right now, then watch online. Um, but you know, the, the other issue with watching online is uh, people feel uh, that it's optional to give. And uh, you know, that's another commandment in the Bible. So the further we stray, from what God says in his word, then the further we get away from the reality of Christianity and of really knowing and serving Christ and into our own uh, man-made ideas and religion, right? So let's stick with the Bible. He said uh, to not come before his presence empty-handed. He said all the tithe is mine and, uh, and the tithe and offerings are what God requires and if you get saved, it's no big thing. But uh, don't don't try to trick yourself into thinking that you're saved if you're not doing what God said in his word. If we're not fulfilling the commandments of God, then we are not of his people. If we're not following his commandments, we're not born again. Because when you're born again, God puts that divine nature according to 1 Peter chapter 1. He's been, we've been made partakers of his divine nature. And in uh, 1 John chapter 4, he said, If his seed is in you, right, whosoever hath his seed in, in him doth not commit sin. And sin is missing the mark. Sin is coming up short, right? If you're playing darts and you, you don't hit the bullseye and it hits the wall instead, you should, probably shouldn't be trying to play darts. You know, you're, you're a menace. <laughs> you're hitting the wall instead of the board. You, you have to, you should, you, you've got a long way to go. But missing the mark, right? Missing the mark, coming up short. If you're at the checkout and you don't have enough money and you have to tell them, well, you have to put that frozen turkey back and you have to put that, uh, that uh, ice cream back because I don't have enough money. Uh, and we've probably all been there, right? At some point in our life, you've been at the register. And you, did, you found out that you had to put something back at the last minute. It's a little bit humiliating, a little bit embarrassing. Well, that's how it is when people say that they're born again Christians and they're coming up short when it comes to their obedience. Our obedience is coming up with the full amount. By the time ante up, this is our part. Right? So, well, God's grace covers me no matter what I do. Not really. If, if we sin willfully, let's get back in Hebrews chapter 10. Chapter 10, Hebrews chapter 10. He said, for if we sin willfully, there remaineth no more sacrifice for sin but a certain fearful looking for of judgment and fiery indignation which shall devour the adversaries. It's in your Bible. So let's, let's, uh, let's have a clear view of what God wants. Let's have a clear view of what God says. And let's have a clear view of what being a Christian really means. Right? Mm -hmm. So we'll do our part. Let's have a Come help us. Sunday tithe and offering. All Christians pay tithe and give offerings to the Lord. Father, thank you for this opportunity once again to one to come into your presence, the opportunity to give back all some of your blessings that you've given to us. God, we ask you to bless the gift and the giver according to their giving in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And if you're watching online, you can find the donation link at myntcc dot org backslash Fresno CA dash giving.
and we appreciate uh, your faithful support. Some people are up and down like a roller coaster. Sometimes they feel like we're in church, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they feel like praying, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they feel like praying, sometimes they don't. Well, thank God, thank God, everyone that is faithful. They take it to heart, it's serious to them, and, and they do it from their heart every single time. That's where it's at, friends. And that's where the blessing of God is. It's in faithfulness. Yes, sir. Uh, unfaithfulness. Faithfulness. So thank you again for your giving today. And the offering to the Lord. May God richly bless you according as you give. Time is not exactly important. We're going to get into it. We're just going to say, don't you worry. I'm multitasking. <laughs> but for men, that means just doing one thing. <laughs> <laughs> and, then, and then when they feel comfortable to you know leave that one thing, and they, and they start to try to do the second thing. <laughs> I'm a man, I'm a, I'm a good multitasker. You, you think you are. Right, let's read that here in the book of Exodus chapter 14. Verse 9. But the Egyptians pursued after them all the horses and chariots of Pharaoh and his horsemen and his army and overtook them in camping by the sea beside Piha Hirot before bales of fun. Let us pray. Sister Oni. Father, thank you for this service we're, that we gathered here for today. We ask that you bless Pastor as he preaches. Help us to receive what you have for us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Uh, the other day I was I was uh, out of traveling out of town. I was attending those services we mentioned, and one of the days we made it down to the beach. And uh, if if you if you want to go to the beach without it being super crowded, um, if you go on Wednesday in February, apparently it's a good time because people that you know have other activities that are you know, they're obligated to do. The middle of the week, you know, they're still busy doing it. And then February still is winter. So, you know, you don't, you don't have like this huge summer crowd out there. But anyway, I made my way to to the water, but I wasn't really dressed to go for a swim. Um, we, we don't really believe in mixed bathing. I know. So I've never heard such a thing in all my life. But... Uh, you know, the Bible teaches that we should be dressed in modest apparel. Mm -hmm. And modest means covered. It means to not uh, dress or present oneself to draw undue attention to yourself. And so mixed bathing, you know, is between uh, the genders, right? Men, men and women. So if it's all just men, right, it's fine to be out there, your swim trunks, whatever. If it's all just women, it's fine. They, they, you know, they're just with themselves separated you know so it's it's uh it's not really an issue but when it's mixed with the genders then people can uh, observe us right? they can see all of our contours all of our secret places right and uh, and a lot of these bathing suits are really just colored underwear and if you look at regular undergarments there's more material in undergarments than there is in these uh, bathing suits that people wear so thankfully, it wasn't uh, overcrowded with people wearing bathing suits out there. It was maybe 100 people uh, all, that, that I saw all together. Um, just just spending some time enjoying nature, enjoying, I love the, I love the ocean. But I wasn't, I wasn't prepared to go into the water. But I was right there where the waves were crashing, the sand was wet. And as I sat there gazing into the Pacific surf, Pacific Ocean, 
it, it just reminded me of how much it is like Peter, where they get to the water's edge of God's salvation, of God's reality, of God's word, of, of, of really receiving something from God. And, and be the will of the Lord, I may, may uh, speak on a series of uh, messages about at the water's edge. At the water's edge. And, you know, people stand there and they can see the water. Right? And, and you can you can feel sometimes even the mist as the waves are crashing and the seagulls are there and the sand is there. All the ingredients are there. But if we don't get into the water of God, we will still be lost. If we can't get into the water of God's salvation, we will still be on our way to hell. It doesn't matter how many times we go to church. It doesn't matter how many times we pray. It doesn't matter how many times we read the scriptures. It doesn't matter how many of our friends are Christians. It doesn't matter how many times you pray over your food or get baptized. Like one of our preachers used to say, you get baptized so many times you know every frog in the river by their first name. That still won't save you, right? That can't save you. You can't, you can't get saved by baptism. We're only saved by grace through faith, and it's the work that Jesus Christ did upon the cross, the just for the unjust, the holy for the unholy, the sinless for the sinful. He shed his blood so that we wouldn't have to. He went to hell so that we wouldn't have to. He took our place so that we wouldn't have to die in our own sins. But to accept Christ means to get into that water. And here in our Bible reading, this is after the death. There's uh, ten plagues got poured out upon Egypt. And I don't have all of them off the top of my head, but there was the plague of turning the water into blood. And there's the plague of frogs. The plague of flies, the plague of locusts, uh, the plague of moraine, the plague of fiery, fiery hail and lightning, and it goes on a few more. Plague of darkness. But the last one was the plague of the death of the firstborn. And God had instructed Moses, this is what the uh, statue would be, and this was to be something that Israel would continue as a memorial to this, what they called the Passover. God instructed that a lamb would be taken for each house, or if the house was few in number, they couldn't eat a whole lamb, then it could be one lamb for you know the next house too, whichever. But the most important thing was that the blood of that lamb was to be put around the door of their tent, around the sides of the door door and he said when I see the blood I will send the death angel through the, all the land of Egypt and he said when I see the blood I will pass over you and it was a statute that, that Israel was to follow for the rest of their days right under under the, the law of Moses to practice this feast of Passover and it's a typification of the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ. We read in John chapter 1, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. That was God's Lamb. And the blood of Jesus must be applied to the door of our heart. Amen. The blood of Jesus must be put all around our lives, our heart, our soul, our minds. So from, from top to bottom and all the way around, we have been sealed by the blood of Jesus so that when God the Father is about to judge a man or a woman's soul and he sees the blood, he will pass over us as well. Amen. That's why there must be the blood of the Lamb. There must be this bloody religion, as some people call it. But how many times... Do people go to church and, and watch maybe services online and you don't hear anything about the cross of Calvary? They don't hear anything about the blood of Jesus? They don't hear anything about the redemptive power and the work of grace that God has done 
through His Son Jesus, when that is the only way to God's salvation. Why would we go to a church that doesn't tell us how we can be born again, how we can be saved, how we can be set free from our sin? And that night, every house in Egypt where there was no blood, the death angel killed the firstborn son in every family. And the Bible says there was not one house in which there was not at least one dead. And he said from the firstborn of Pharaoh to the firstborn of the servants that served at the lowest level, from the highest to the lowest level, everywhere in between, the firstborn died because they did not have the blood of the Lamb to protect them. And after this, God said, they will send you out, they will thrust you out of the land. So here was Moses and the children of Israel of men of fighting age 600,000, but Bible scholars will tell you there was a mixed multitude uh, also involved that was closer to 6 million in number altogether. And all the young, all the old, if you've ever been camping or hiking or something, you, you, you find out pretty, pretty quick that not everybody in the family can handle the same type of terrain. So, uh, you, you want to go to Disneyland? Well, they, they've got a bum leg, they're not going to be able to walk, so you got to put them in a wheelchair, so wherever you can't go with the wheelchair, you can't go. You know, with the group, so. And kids, you know, they're, they're kind of fragile. Uh, they, they have a lot of energy when it comes to uh, bouncing around inside the house, but you take them on one of them long walks, boy, it's not, <laughs> it's not, not the same. They don't, they don't have, seem to have as much energy as the adults at that, that time. So here they were out there in the wilderness, and there was a desert. On one side, there was a mountain range. On the other side, the Red Sea in front of them at the water's edge. That's the best water there is. The Red Sea in front of them and coming hot on their trail. Amen. Coming up on their six was Pharaoh and his army. Because after they thrust them out of the land, they said, what, what came over us? Why did we let all of our slaves go? The Hebrews were slaves to the Egyptians for many, many years. So they were coming up hot on their trail. Verse 7, when Pharaoh drew nigh, the children of Israel looked at their eyes, and behold, the Egyptians marched after them. They were sore afraid. And the children of Israel cried out unto the Lord, and they said unto Moses, because there were no graves in Egypt, hast thou taken us away to die in the wilderness? Wherefore hast thou dealt thus with us to carry us forth out of Egypt? I know none of us have ever been so afraid of the circumstances. None of us have ever complained to God's servant or to God himself and say, God, but why why did you leave me down this road? This, I'm going to die out here. Shouldn't I stay back over here where the grass was greener? Right? People think the grass is greener on the other side, but you don't know. Right? If you're, if you're, on, if you're on that side, the grass on that side might look greener too. They cried out unto the Lord. Verse 11, they said unto Moses, verse 12, is not this the word that we did tell thee in Egypt, saying, let us alone, that we may serve the Egyptians? For it had been better for us to serve the Egyptians than that we should die in the wilderness. You know, and that's that's just unbelief talking to me. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that regret. You know, you, you, you find yourself going out on a limb 
and then you feel like you should have stayed closer to the, the, uh, the, the middle of the tree, right? Not out on this limb. Now, now you're out here in open air. They were exposed. There was no escape that they could see. But this is not what they said. We read earlier in the book of Exodus that the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of their oppression. Because of the oppression of the Egyptians. Because they served under hard taskmasters. Because the burden of their work was heavy. And because they were uh, instructed to kill all the firstborn or all the male children. And to save a lot of the female children. And Moses himself was supposed to be killed during that time period. But his life was protected. Right? That his, his, uh, the, his, uh, his mother hid him away, nursed him, hid him away. And then they set him in a little, uh, little boat, if you will. They set it there in the, into the river, the Nile River. <coughs> and Pharaoh's daughter found, heard the baby crying, the baby Moses crying. And she sent her servants to go look where the sound was coming from. And they came with the baby Moses, which means drawn out. Moses means drawn out. They drew him out of the water. And, and we already know all the history there. But God had ordained Moses to be this deliverer. God had ordained Moses. Amen. At 80 years of age. At 80 years of age. So next time you feel old, <laughs> you look in the mirror and you feel disappointed. Because the face you look at is not the same as the face you remember. <laughs> right? And, and you, you can see new lines where there wasn't lines the last time you, you paid close attention. Just remember, Moses was 80. 80 years old. When God mm -hmm. called him. To lead his people out. Verse 13. And Moses said unto the people. Fear you not. Stand still and see the salvation of the Lord. Which he will show to you today. For the Egyptians whom you have seen today. You shall see them again. No more forever. Verse 14. The Lord shall fight for you. And ye shall hold your peace. And the Lord said unto Moses. Wherefore criest thou unto me? So apparently, Moses was encouraging the people, but he himself had his own doubts and his own reservations, his own fears. Because there he was crying out to God, saying, God, they, they're kind of, I, I know they're wrong, what they're saying, but they kind of make a valid point here. What are we doing? What are we supposed to do? Wherefore, where were Christ thou unto me? Speak unto the children of Israel that they go forward. Or, but they're at the water's edge. Yes. But they had to go through the water. Verse 16. But lift thou up thy rod and stretch out thy hand, thine hand over the sea and divide it. And the children of Israel shall go on dry ground through the midst of the sea. And I, behold, I will harden the hearts of the Egyptians, and they shall follow them. And I will give me honor upon Pharaoh and upon all his host, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. And the Egyptians shall know that I am the Lord, when I have gotten me honor upon Pharaoh, upon his chariots, and upon his horsemen. Now that's faith, isn't it? God said, I'm going to take you through this impossible path. But the Bible says, is there anything too hard for the Lord? Man. Jesus, speaking to his disciples, said, with man, this is impossible, but not with God. For with God, nothing shall be impossible. See, God's the one that said everything. And orchestrator set everything in motion. He set all the laws of physics. Emotion. So if God wants to make an exception to the natural laws, God can do it. There was Jesus walking on the water. That wasn't supposed to be, be able to happen. 
walking on water. He had no sin weighing him down. He had no unbelief weighing him down. He had no uh, worldly ambitions weighing him down. He was totally weightless and pure before God. And you know, the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And instead of walking around, the, the body of water there is walking on top of him. Hey, just another day at the office for Jesus. Amen. But when people look at things like that and say, well, that's impossible. But not with God. With God, nothing shall be impossible. And when we're in that situation, where we're in that battle and you have that fog of war, and you can't really see uh, what's, what's approaching, what's around, you're in that type of fog and all you hear is the noise of the enemy around and you're not sure what's going to happen or how I'm going to get through this. God will make a way. God will make a way for you. God will make a way for you, uh, for me. God will make a way for everyone that believes because that's what we have to do. We have to step forward from the water's edge. Get your feet out there. Get them wet. Yes, get them sir. in there. Where, where it looks impossible, but he said move forward. At the water's edge, and there's several other nice nice scriptures. Show, shows us God's people at the water's edge. Amen. <laughs> well, obviously, we're not trying to get all of it today. So I'm talking about God, Lord willing, serious, serious message. Verse 19, And the angel of God which went before the camp of Israel, We'll see, there's, there's a new aspect here, isn't there? They weren't all alone by themselves. And after all, it wasn't just six million uh, of the Israelites and the mixed multitude. After all, there was six million plus one. The angel of God. The Bible tells us that God's angels are ministering spirits unto God's heirs of salvation. The Bible shows us that there was an angel of God. When Jesus was there in the Garden of Gethsemane, his disciples were of little help. You know, not, not as uh, Reverend Hall was preaching the other night, nine of them were at the gate going into the garden. Three of them entered the gate where it went, went in, but they were, they were all tired. It was late at night. I don't know if anybody, everybody else has experienced that. Sometimes you're, you're with your pastor, and it's late at night, and you're dead tired, but you've got to wax the floor with the church or get the church ready for Sunday morning or, or whatever. And, and uh, But that, that's some of the sweetest times. After midnight, amen. <laughs> <laughs> After midnight, doing something for the Lord, amen. <laughs> So I love the Lord. So we'll see you after midnight. <laughs> I wish you love the Lord after midnight, okay? Let's do something for the Lord. Only as, as the need requires. I'm not saying you got to do something for God after midnight. Amen. Those three entered the garden. They fell asleep. Jesus prayed for an hour or so. He came over and looked at them and said, what? You can watch me for one hour? And, you know, I'm sure it's not the same as us. Like you think that Jesus is perfect, but if it was like if it was like one of us, we might find our buddies over there asleep, and and they say, "But you could you could hold on for an hour after everything I've done for you." <laughs> After all the help I've given you, after everything I've done, I was there for you when you needed me, and you can't be here for me when I need you. But Jesus was not alone. There was an angel that appeared, and he was there with Jesus, strengthening him. In Jesus' desperate time of need, in the most desperate struggle of his life, there was an angel of God there giving him the strength and I want you to know today, God's angels are still available and they yes, are sir. still there ready to help us when we are in our extreme moment of our lives. 
Don't think that you're all alone. We are not alone. God is with us. Jesus said, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. He said, I shall be with you. God is with us today. Amen. Amen. So John Wesley, one of, the, one of his famous quotes is, the best of all is God is with us. The devil wants to try to convince us we're all alone. We're facing this great struggle. We're going through this great hardship, etc. And we're all alone, but we are not alone. God is with us. Jesus lives within the Holy Spirit. If you've been filled with the Holy Ghost, the Holy Spirit is within you. God's angels are ministering to the heirs of salvation. And you, we just got to keep holding on. Everybody wants the, the blessing of God and, and the answer from God to be like instant rice, minute rice. God, I need you to be like Johnny on the spot. Right here, right now, exactly when I want you to be there. But God moves in his time. Amen. God moves in his time. And sometimes the answer may take 12 years. Like the woman with the issue of blood. Do you, what do you think she was going through for those 12 years? How many days did she struggle? How many days what, what, did she feel abandoned? How many times did she feel she was forsaken? But at the end of the 12 years, that was God's time. Amen? So well, at that time, Jesus was probably in his 20s, right? He had started his earthly ministry at that time. Yeah, he was, he was, uh, he was living a perfect life, but he wasn't necessarily ministering, preaching to people. But in God's time, mm -hmm. God meets the need. God shows up in his time and in a way where God receives the most of the glory. Amen. God, God deserves all the glory. Angel God before the camp of uh, Israel removed and went behind them. And the pillar of the cloud went from before their face and stood behind them. Verse 20. And it came and it came between the camp of the Egyptians and the camp of Israel. And it was a cloud and darkness to them. But it gave light by night to these. So that the one came not near the other all the night. Isn't that amazing? There was this cloudy pillar that uh, was leading them. It signified the very presence of God. And when they got to the Red Sea, God moved that cloudy pillar, and it was a pillar of fire by night. And God moved that pillar from in front of Israel to between Israel and the Egyptian, the Pharaoh and the Egyptian army. And on the one side, it was light and warmth, and on the other side, it was darkness. Mm. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. And the Lord caused the sea to go back by a strong east wind all that night and made the sea dry land and the waters were divided. And the children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. And the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Sounds like a miracle to me. Yes, sir. Amen. And that's, uh, that's the problem with miracles. God does them when it suits him. Not, not always when we want him to. Jesus showed up to Bethany after, after Lazarus had died. And both of uh, Lazarus' sisters, Martha and Mary, they both said, Lord, if you had been here, our brother would not have died. And sometimes people think God is late. He shows up late to the party. But Jesus is always right on time. Amen. In that, that, that moment of desperation, in that moment when, when there's nothing else that man can do, Jesus shows up. There's a, there's a song that uh, we used to sing. Called, uh, it's called Standing Somewhere in the Shadows. You'll find Jesus. Standing somewhere in the shadows. You'll find Jesus. He's, he's there in the wings. He's there waiting for that right moment to step in. Amen. 
and, and do his thing. God does miracles like nobody else. Amen. Because nobody else can. <laughs> yes, sir. <laughs> if it's a miracle, God did it. If it's a miracle, only God can do it. Amen. The children of Israel went into the midst of the sea upon the dry ground. The waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on the left. So they're walking through this canyon. These waters, how high, we don't, we don't know, 30 feet, 40 feet, 50 feet, 100 feet, who knows. But there, on the left side, there was water. And the right side, there was water. But they were walking through the middle on dry, dry ground. And the Egyptians pursued and went in after them to the midst of the sea, even all Pharaoh's horses, his chariots, and his horsemen. And it came to pass that in the morning watch, the Lord looked unto the host of the Egyptians through the pillar of fire and of the cloud and troubled the host of the Egyptians and took off their chariot wheels. That they drave them heavily so that the Egyptians said, Let us free, let us flee from the face of Israel. For the Lord fighteth for them against the Egyptians. So here was Israel getting away through a path that God made for them. But Pharaoh and the Egyptians, this path wasn't for them. They, they were trying to follow the same pathway, but they were not of God's people. They were the enemy. Of God's people. They were trying to kill them. They were trying to take them prisoner. They're trying to capture them, take them back into Egypt, put them back into slavery and bondage. But God wasn't going to allow that to happen. And there's another song that we sing sometimes. And it says, If you're digging a ditch, you better dig too. Because the ditch you made for me just might be for you. I guess that still is just one ditch. <laughs> I don't write the songs. If it's the same ditch they dig for you, then that's the only one. But here they were in God's ditch. They were in God's bowling alley. And God was getting ready to throw that strike. Amen? Amen. And there wasn't just ten pins out there. We don't even know how many. I mean, there was a whole gob of Pharaoh's army. There's a whole gob of them. More than you can shake a stick at. There was so many. Man, there was just a bunch. There was just so many. <laughs> you belabor the point. <laughs> but there was so many Egyptians there, man. You couldn't believe it. You were all over the place. And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand over the sea. The same rod of deliverance, of salvation, that God used. God chose to use that as a symbol. Showing the connection between God, his miracle, God's man, Moses, and that rod stretching it out, his, his work of faith. Right? If you don't believe, you're not going to stretch your hand out there. So, pfft. Why am I going to put my rod out there? It's not, you know, it's just a stick. What's that going to do? But it's it's in that childlike faith where we do things that makes absolutely no sense to us. When it makes no sense at all. So I'm just going to do it anyway. What have you got to lose? Man. Right? If God is telling you to do something that seems foolish to the carnal mind, then just go ahead and do it anyway. I'm not, I'm not talking about praying in tongues at the top of your voice you know, at work or something crazy like that. It's just, that's not God. God won't tell you to do that. But something silly that makes no sense. Like here. He said, stretch out your rod. That's faith. He said, I'm going to do what God said. When God says it, right? he used to say, God said it. I believe it. That settles it. No, God said it. That says, whether we believe it or don't believe it, yeah, God's word sir. is still true. But if we don't act with faith, we don't act upon his word by faith, we will not experience the miracle. 
Everybody wants God to do things for them, but they're not willing to put any uh, effort behind it. They call people call upon God in their time of desperation, but they've never surrendered their heart to Jesus. And then bad things happen, and they blame God. They say, God, why did you do this to me? It's kind of like uh, if you were just filthy rich. Right? I mean, you, you had money. You could burn a stack of $100, $100 bills every day of your life, and you would never miss it. I mean, just filthy, filthy rich. And so, like, all, all the people that know you, they come around, and, and they, they start talking to you, and then next thing you know, they're asking for money. Because they know you're filthy rich. They know you have it. So it becomes this situation where every conversation you have with every person, it always seems like it comes back around again to money. Can I have some money? But you are still a person, right? You're not, you're not just a, a walking checkbook. And you still have feelings. And it's so much like God, where people are always going to God asking Him for money, if you will. Asking God for a favor. Asking God for uh, some kind of divine intervention, some kind of help. And, and you know, and God's a person. And he has feelings. And, and uh, you know, just like if you're that filthy rich person, wouldn't you want somebody just to, you know, stop by just to say hello? Wouldn't you like it if somebody brought you a little bag of coffee? Coffee beans are pretty nice. Juro, coffee and snow. Juro's are nice. You know. Just so nice. They just really grind the beans up. <laughs> Perfect cup of coffee. Every single time. I mean, they're just really good. And so when you're filthy rich, why would anybody give you something? You got money to burn, stack a hundred dollar bills, you never miss it. You can get all the coffee beans you want. But still, as a person, the feeling you get when somebody says, Here, I just want to be a blessing to you. I was thinking about you. And I know you probably have all the coffee you want, but here's some coffee. I just want to be a blessing. I, I, you know, I, I appreciate you. And how much does God get that type of treatment from people? Where God, where people go to God and they say, God, I just want to thank you. I just want to thank you, Lord, for all your goodness and your blessings to me. I don't have nothing I need to ask you about today, Lord. I know. No prayer requests for me, Lord. And I'm not, I'm not trying to make you take care of all my heavy lifting and do all the dirty work for me, God. I just want to thank you. I just want to tell you, Lord, I appreciate you and I love you. Mm. When's the last time you said to God, I love you? He's a person. He has feelings. Mm. So think about that next time you go with your laundry list. The Lord, I want, you know, I need a new, new pair of brown socks. I want a sale on the you know, steaks at the store. No, you know, maybe for this now. I touch my body. You know, and help this and help that one. But just to thank him, to praise him, to give him glory and honor, and to tell him you love him. Hmm. And I'm not saying don't pray and ask for what you, what you need. Ask for what you need. That's scriptural. God, Jesus said, whatever you have, you know, ask. You shall receive. But I'm just saying, if all we do is approach God like Daddy Warbucks, it's like, you know, hey, can I have some money? It's like, did you, can you even say, how are you doing? <laughs> can we even say good morning first? I mean, something, come on. <laughs> the Lord said unto Moses, stretch out that hand over the sea that the waters may come again upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots, and upon their horsemen. And Moses stretched forth his hand over the sea, and the sea returned to his strength when the morning appeared, and the Egyptians fled against it. And the Lord overthrew the Egyptians in the midst of the sea. And the waters returned and covered the chariots and the horsemen, and all the host of Pharaoh that came into the sea after them, there remained not so much as one of them. The very vehicle God used to bring salvation to Israel, to Moses and to Israel, was the same vehicle he used to run over Pharaoh and all of his army. The very word of God that is a blessing 
to every Christian heart, to every Christian soul. And it brings comfort, it brings soothing, it brings, uh, uh, what do we call it? So there's, a, there's a word I want to say. Am I coming here? Maybe, maybe I'll remember by next week. But it just, it just brings confirmation. Right? The word of God is it's just, it's soothing to the soul because we, we rest in Jesus Christ and in the Holy Spirit knowing that all things that are necessary for our salvation, God has already accomplished. But the Bible tells us that the same, same, uh, same gospel that is a savor of life, it's in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 1, what we found to be a savor of life to those that are saved is a savor of death to those who do not believe. So the very, very word of God that comforts the Christian's life, it's the same word that brings condemnation to the sinner. And we can choose to be part of God's Israel spiritually, or we can choose to be part of Egypt, which is everything sinful and of the devil and of the world. We can choose what side of that flood we want to be on. But right now, we're standing at the water's edge. And we could be looking at a path of salvation, or we could be looking at a path that will bring death and destruction and judgment. But the final outcome, it's entirely up to us. And that's one of the things that people miss on the uh, in the modern day world. It, so much of what so much of what people are following today. It's about separation from personal accountability. It's, it's because this other color of person. It's because of this, or it's because of the color that I am. Or it's because of, uh, you know, uh, it's this, I was born on the wrong side of the railroad tracks, or I, I was born cursed. Some people think they're cursed. Like the, uh, the illustration Reverend Kinson shared about this person had a tattoo put on uh, some part of their body. And he tattooed on there the born loser. And apparently it was it was something that, you know, more than more than a few people would get that tattoo. And the uh, the man was in Asia and he said he said uh, he said tattoo on the mind before it's on the body. And so people think that way. They think that they just can't change. They think that they just can't overcome whatever type of limitation they have. They think that uh, all the circumstances are against them and there's no way to surmount them, just like Israel did. For all intents and purposes. And we're almost done. Man, this guy. Whew. This man, you better bring lunch next time, you know? Yeah. It's going to be a long time. <laughs> Pastor Davis used to say, if you get done, if you get done listening before I get done preaching, just wave at me. <laughs> oh man. But to all intents and purposes, to the natural eyes, to the natural senses, it seemed like a lost cause. But then it always comes back around to where is your faith? Where is our faith? That the psalmist said there in uh, one, of, one of the psalms, Psalm 37, maybe. He said, my, my, my tears are my meat night and day. And they testify to him. His tears would speak to him symbolically. And his tears would say, where is your God? When we're crying and we feel helpless and we feel despondent and we feel that there's no hope and we feel like there's nothing brighter, better to come, that is unbelief. Faith sees the path through the Red Sea. Faith says, I'm going to step out there anyway. Either God's going to open this water or I'm going to walk on top of it like Jesus. Something is going to happen because God is with me. Amen. 
right? He said, he that spared not his own son, how shall he not also with him freely give us all things? Right? He said, if God is, God is in us and we're with God, he said, God cannot deny himself. Right? God is with us. God is in you if you're born again filled with the Holy Spirit. God is with us. God is in our life. We just have to believe it. Keep believing. But the children of Israel walked upon dry land in the midst of the sea, and the waters were a wall unto them on their right hand and on their left. Thus the Lord saved Israel that day out of the hand of the Egyptians, and Israel saw the Egyptians dead upon the sea. And Israel saw that great work which the Lord did upon the Egyptians. And the people feared the Lord and believed the Lord and his servant Moses. How about it today? Are we going to choose to believe? Or are we going to choose to be an unbeliever? Are we going to choose to step forward in faith? He said, we will, we will either live by faith or we'll die by doubt. And the Bible exhorts us in the book of Hebrews. He said, brethren, take heed, lest there be in any of you an evil heart of unbelief. When we stop believing in God, that God has a plan for us, God has a, a, a solution for every problem, that whatever's coming against us, whatever happens, we need. Job went through suffering. Every, every Christian is tried. And the, the Apostle Peter said, Think it not strange concerning the fiery trial, which is to try you as though some strange thing has happened unto you. He said, For all that live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So we're no better than the early church. Did you know all of the original 12 disciples, you know, Judas, we know he committed suicide. But the other, the other, you know, and then Paul was the replacement. So those 12, of those 12 men, only one of them died a natural death, and that was John. All the rest of those men were killed as martyrs. Stephen the first, he was not an apostle necessarily. He was uh, commissioned to be a deacon. But they killed him in Acts chapter 7, the first martyr of, of the early church. We are no better than they are. Yeah. Jesus himself was killed as a righteous, perfect, holy man. And we're no better than Jesus. So whatever happens in this life, we cannot become obsessed with it. We cannot become worried about it because God has a plan. God has not forsaken us. God has not forgotten us. And at the end of, the, at the end of life's journey, God is there waiting for us. Mm -hmm. Right? Jesus is just the other side of that water waiting for us to come home. So we don't hope in this. He said if we have hope in this life only, if we have hope in Christ in this life only, we are of all men most miserable. And that's that's the most misquoted scripture. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're the most miserable. <laughs> you always get that. Yeah. We are of all men most miserable. We're not hoping just in this life. Man. We're looking ahead to a brighter day. Amen. Not on earth, but in heaven. Not in the flesh, but in the spirit. Not, not, in our, not in our own strength, but in the strength that Christ gives. Right? The apostle Paul had the thorn in the flesh. It was really bothering him. It was really a, an, an oppressive burden on his heart, on his mind. He said he prayed to the Lord three times. That it be removed from him. And the Lord appeared to him and said, My grace is sufficient for you. He said, For in weakness is my strength made perfect. And then the Apostle Paul said, Therefore I will the more earnestly rejoice in my sufferings. For when I am weak, he is strong. And that's where it's at, friends. Mm -hmm. We're going to go through some stuff. Mm -hmm. But that doesn't mean God hates us. That doesn't mean God is against us. And the Bible tells us in Romans 8, 28, 
and we know, and we know, all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purposes. And if we love God and we're called according to his purposes, it's going to work for our good. Yes. No matter how bad and how dark it seems, right? God will never forsake us. And at this time, as we begin to find a place to pray, just for a while. Talking about the water's edge. Water's edge. I come before you today And there's just one thing that I want to say
lift your voice. Thank you, Lord. Sinners going to sin. Christians going to go to church and believe in God and worship Jesus. Um, if you want to try to influence sinners um, to come to this side, right? but don't let them influence you to go back into the world. Um, you want to be you want to be a thermostat, not a thermometer. Amen. A thermostat will change the air temperature in the room, and the thermometer just matches whatever the air temperature is. So we want to be a positive force in a negative world. Mm -hmm. um, it's been good to be in service with you under our Bible study slash service online or in person. You're welcome to come over to, to our place Wednesday evening, 7.30. And I'm looking forward to being in that, uh, that activity with you at that time. And uh, if nothing else, we'll see you next Sunday. Mm -hmm. God bless you. Have a blessed weekend. Mm -hmm. <laughs>